It was a fucking nightmare mm -hmm. experience. My drive for this like ever receding horizon of fulfillment in you know, my intoxication would take me to the darkest places and I would, you know, effectively destroy relationships, humiliate myself, which created a shame spiral, which drove me to want to distance myself from my emotion. <laughs> it's just so entertained over here and I love it. I love it. It makes it light. It's true. It's like it, there were comic. I know what you're thinking about. <laughs> Am I taking it to get deeper into the now? Or am I taking it to avoid more of the now? Three people in college from ASU died from a heroin overdose. And two of them, I was the guy that introduced them to partying. I introduced them to drugs, you know? And that's a, that was a hard pill to swallow. It's really learning how to distinguish between the light, the real light, and then the false light, and where that lives within you, and make peace with all of these forces that are inside. The more that you experience world as heaven, the more you want to fight to save it, of course. For sure. Like the more you love something, the more fiercely you're going to protect it. And then the more you love life, the more you want to build a beautiful life and also share because your cup is full and abundant. You want to share that beautiful life with everybody else. There's more of a blurred line of distinction between medicine and drugs than people realize because even sacred psychedelic plant medicine can be utilized as a drug and it can lead to abuse or can lead to other problems. And oftentimes many things labeled as drugs can have medicinal properties, can have connective properties, can allow you to experience and explore an aspect of yourself that was formerly hidden. So we're offering this podcast with Caitlin, Kyle, and Eric to share our experiences, not to encourage anybody to do anything, but just to understand that it's going to happen when you're at a festival or where you're at a party, you're going to be around people or perhaps participating in the utilization of these substances. So we wanted to share, all right, here's where it might go okay, and here's where it could turn absolutely tragic. And it's important to understand both of those categories and to realize that abstinence and pretending that we're not gonna interact with these substances is just not real, it's not helpful. So as veterans of the game, we just wanted to offer our wisdom, advice, experience from a loving place and say, Here's the field as we know it and understand it. Here's where we've fallen and here's where things have gone all right. So without further ado, sharing this podcast with Caitlin, Kyle, and Eric. All right, fam, here we are for everybody. This is Caitlin, Eric, and Kyle. My best friends on planet Earth. Good job. Kyle's, Kyle's in a mood today. This is going to be great. I'm ready. This is going to be great. So one of the things that I wanted to talk about is we recognize and we have all the statistics in that you just teach about abstinence and it doesn't actually work to encourage kids to understand sexuality, to understand what's going on with STDs. also denies them the actual real pleasure of fucking, right? Like, come on, y'all. Like, it's going to happen. There's a strong desire for it. And so much better is to actually explain from experience where things have been beautiful, where things have actually gotten ugly and messy. But sex isn't our subject today. It's <laughs> drugs and medicines and the blurred line between drugs and medicines and how medicines can be drugs and drugs can be medicines and how sometimes they're somewhere in between and actually that becomes the post-tragic stage of this development. And that's not actually a bad map to look at. But I first want to say the first caveat being, this is not a podcast to encourage anybody to do drugs. Yeah, disclaimer, now, disclaimer, disclaimer. Yeah, exactly. Like, this is not the purpose. The purpose is, y'all are going to do drugs. You guys are already <laughs> doing <laughs> drugs. <laughs> drugs. So why don't you We're hear from ex <laughs> like people who, with experience in doing both drugs and medicines and actually have some guidance instead of people just saying, no, let's not talk about it. Let's keep this part of our life quiet. Except if you see us at Burning Man, we're going to be fucking blasted and we're all going to know that we're blasted, but we're still just not going to talk <laughs> about it. And so this is an opportunity to open that up. Um, and uh, yeah, well, so we'll talk about festivals. We'll talk about parties. We'll talk about, you know, sex will probably come up, we'll, but we'll talk about these drugs sex and medicines. Sex and drugs do go together. Sex and drugs and house. <laughs> <laughs> I thought the same thing. 
<laughs> so where did you guys begin? Because I think I have a unique path in that really my first experience with drugs was my experience with medicine. Now, I did get high with my stepbrothers and it was just purely recreational. We were just like eating junk food and laughing. And it was like, so that did happen prior to my first Vision Quest journey, but it was a very small kind of like limited experience. Um, and now cannabis is like a real sacred medicine and a recreational medicine for me, both. But still, I prefer it more on the sacred side. You know, I don't like find myself smoking a lot out at just social situations. It's not just my go-to, but nonetheless, I recognize it has application on both sides. But for you guys, where did your first kind of experiences with anything, drugs, medicines, really start to kick in? And then what did you start to learn really quick? You want to go first, Caitlin? <laughs> <laughs> We're just going in order. Wow. It's not because no, of any other reason. This one question Next could be an entire podcast, but um, I will try to <laughs> distill it down. Um, no, I, I was actually, um, I grew up pretty timid about things like this. I grew up Catholic. You know, sex was like, not a bad thing in my house, but it just wasn't talked about. My mom really tried to protect her five daughters and just like keep us innocent and young for a long time. And so I had this imprint of, of, um, skepticism and kind of, I was conservative and, and nervous about it, you know, intoxication. So there were like a couple of so let, high let me, school let me bring in Let me bring in, <laughs> let me bring in one concept here that I think will help because something's coming to me is that Mm -hmm. The pre-tragic stage, there's three stages, stages of, of really anything you want to talk about. There's the pre-tragic, the tragic, and the post-tragic. And then the pre-tragic, that just means that things are clear. So drug negative opinion, drugs are bad. All drugs are bad. That's mm -hmm. pre-tragic, actually. Yeah. Everything mm -hmm. is simple. Everything makes sense. There's clarity. Sex is, a, sex is a sin. You know, mm -hmm. that fundamentalist belief, that's pre-tragic. Or there's the way that animals would look at it the dolphins that get high puff puff passing on that puffer fish with the mm. toxin and then they <laughs> days off and the elephants that eat and baboons that eat the fermented fruit baboons that steal like you know barrels of fucking beer and get drunk and yep. all of the the jaguars that be tripping and like <laughs> all of the animals it's like yeah this is awesome and it's very simple and it can be simple for humans too think of the way that People used to look at wine or you look at beer. You know, you watch any old movie, all they're drinking in every time the warrior stops is ale. Like you never the see them drink water. Yeah. <laughs> like how many, how many times did wow. you see people on Game hydrate. of Thrones drink water <laughs> or hydrate? It was always ale or wine yeah. the whole uh -huh. time. Like we understand that there was like this pre-tragic view, like, yeah, this is good. It makes me feel good. And then things get complicated as we start to understand, all right, there's dangers, there's checks and minuses, there's addictive tendencies, there's all that. And that's where things are confused. And then there's where we're trying to land this podcast is the post-tragic, which says, you know, there are aspects of the pre-tragic that are true and that we need to reclaim. There's some bad aspects, there's some beautiful aspects, and there's a first simplicity and instance that can be reclaimed after embracing the mm -hmm. whole field of the tragic where things get confusing and complicated and complex and and painful and and we're kind of sorting it out into the post tragic where we can actually you know enter into this field with full understanding full awareness full consciousness and have the best fucking time 100 percent. so within that framework we had a little bit of what you were talking about which was kind of like the pre-tragic it's all bad drugs are bad sex yeah, is it was bad intimidating. it's all bad yeah and then but there's some part of you that knew like mm, oh. <laughs> i don't think this is quite right 100 percent. um there was of course i think when you're given that framework of suppression and this stark delineation between good and, good and bad there's an allurement to the unknown of the quote-unquote bad and that definitely influenced the way that I proceeded to <clears throat> be drawn to intoxication. But for me, there was a little bit of experimental dabbling with alcohol in um, high school and uh, like on prom night. But it wasn't really until I was in college and I was working at a, a Mexican food restaurant and they had a shots night and I, they asked me to be the shots girl. And then I've got, I had my first like vodka and Sprite and it was like all my inhibitions. See, I grew up feeling 
I was pretty shy, but I also had this really big personality, which yeah. eventually got to... You were to, a girl about to go wild. <laughs> I was a girl about to go wild. <laughs> oh, boy, did I. Yes. That, she gone. <laughs> <laughs> she gone. Girl gone bad. Uh, yeah. So I started to drink. And the drinking, um, when I worked in my first bar job, was like this euphoric sense of freedom. And I think this is really important for me to bring into this um, this conversation is really ultimately reclaiming that sense of freedom in yourself without um, feeling like you need the, the substance to do it for you. But it did do it for me and it felt like freedom. I felt confident enough to be myself and to be wild and big and loud and in this way that I hadn't really felt before. Um, but I was still a pretty, uh, like, nervous about, quote, unquote, drugs. And it was like this, um, this taboo, you know. And so I think it was, I was about like 21 or so, and I was at a party. And I grew up also having really big challenges with um, diagnosed ADHD. It was like very hard for me to stay present and stay on track and feel awake. So I was never really drawn to anything that made me sleepy, like pills mm -hmm. or cannabis, anything that brought me more into that deep, like mm -hmm. out of control state. Um, but I remember being at a party and there were some girls that were dooters doing cocaine. And I was like, oh my God, they're doing cocaine. Like, and I remember I yeah. put like a little bit on my gums after some encouragement <laughs> from my friends. And suddenly I felt like, zing, I'm awake and everything's really exciting. And it was these, it was these introductions through the substances that helped me suddenly feel an expression of myself that I hadn't had the freedom or capacity to feel before. And that opened up into this um, relationship throughout my 20s and I think when I was around 23, having MDMA for the first time with my boyfriend and like massaging each other mm -hmm. and like be just the, the aliveness ultimately was the feeling I started chasing in the pre-tragic world was I haven't felt this alive before. Right. So it, so it almost flipped from this, this is all bad. And then you actually recognize the, you know, the allurement <laughs> to the reason why people are drawn to these things yeah. because it's unlocking aspects of yourself that you can't access normally so it's providing like a bridge to states of consciousness which unlock expressions of yourself yeah that are desirable and yeah, fundamentally you can't necessarily attain in right day to day with that yes Monday and night. and then after in the post tragic after you've gotten there and the and the medicines or drugs have gotten you there <laughs> then you can learn all right, can I get there? Can I get there without them? Sometimes yes, sometimes no. Yeah. But and either I'll, way, either way, like in then you also, so in that process, there, it almost flipped over to a pre-tragic, like this is good. It's allowing me to access these states. But then certainly pretty soon in, you had to start experiencing the tragic, whether that was that first oh, fucking did. horrible hangover. Because I wasn't even talking about alcohol, but I remember my junior prom, you know, there's a girl who said yes to go to prom with me and then got immediately back with her boyfriend. And I was like, oh, cool. Like, you can take her to prom. And he's like, no, man, you'd take care of it. Oh, man. And I was like, oh, this is the worst. <laughs> I was like, this is fucking terrible. And so I just got blacked out on Goldschlager. God, I was yes, so, with the gold plate. Uh, yeah, Goldschlager on prom oh, was no, my thing. It, it was so bad. And I was so hungover and so sick. I was just in the shower on like medium temperature and just like puking and then drinking the oh. water that was coming off my face. Oh man. And like that's like, that's that first tragic moment. Yeah. Where you're like, fuck, like alcohol feels like the most incredible, amazing feeling. And then you do one of those things and you're like, fuck. I'll never <laughs> forget my, my sister. I was at my sister and her boyfriend were staying at my house at one point way back in, in our twenties. Um, and I remember he came home at like 7 a.m. and I could hear them in the bathroom and she's like, stop drinking water out of my hair. <laughs> she was just kidding. It was Josh Esley. <laughs> it was great. Uh, you get real thirsty after a long night. <laughs> uh, but yes, I, I went deep into the tragic and I can go there later, but I, I'll pass it down to you guys to share about your first experiences. There was a lot for me, for sure. Yeah, so for me, I was one of those people that was arrogant and believed that he was better than everybody else because he wouldn't drink. But really, I was just afraid to like change my consciousness. And it wasn't until I was in college, I think I was a freshman, 
where my friend finally talked me into smoking weed. So I really didn't drink and I kind of just jumped right to weed. And in my arrogance, I ended up smoking three blunts in a row because I kept saying I don't feel high. And he just would look at me after the first blunt and he was like, and then I'd smoke another one. By the time <laughs> that we got oh, midway through the third one, uh, for people who have gotten really high, high there is a uh, <laughs> experience that happens that's called like time skipping, where it's like you, you just end up in a moment and you, you don't know how you got there. <laughs> so my first time being high was absolutely tragic because I ended up <laughs> face down on the floor, convinced that I had actually gotten my dick slammed in a car door and that oh I had gone to the hospital and that I had lost my dick and I was in denial of the fact this was the first time I ever got high. Never heard this story before, now, guys. Um, so I started tragic first. I just went in tragic. And then well, no, you that, had the, you had a pre tragic you had a pre tragic clarity that true. there was a value proposition. I'm better of, than everybody who does drugs. Sobriety is sobriety is good. Mm -hmm. Drugs are bad. I'm sober so i'm good and i'm better it was very clear yeah true and then the mo the moment you you jumped in you slammed into <laughs> actually actually Dick a confirmation <laughs> a confirmation of your original thesis it was so bad i i still remember my friend's face he was playing call of duty <laughs> i hope he's listening to this he was playing call of duty and so i got so high where it felt like my entire face melted and i was just eyeballs and then that's when i had the like remember <laughs> Remembering of the fact that my dick got slammed in a car door <laughs> and he's playing Call of Duty and he's so high that his eyes are only red. He doesn't even have an <laughs> iris anymore. And I look over to him like I just go from zombie to what the fuck did you do? <laughs> and I, the way he was like, huh? <laughs> he was just so high and so innocent. And we had a third friend who was on the bed like because we were basically bachelors and there was a bed in the living room. I don't want to talk about it. He's just <laughs> laughing and laughing at me. So it was horrible. So anyway, <laughs> after that, I figured out how to smoke weed and not hallucinate. And everything became beautiful. Like I wanted to re-listen to every song I yeah. ever loved. And just like, yeah. I would just be in my room listening to music and like re-watching movies and just re-experiencing everything that I had ever liked as a kid because I was convinced we'd made it better. Red Hot Chili Peppers is so good. <laughs> no, for me, it was Lincoln Park. Uh, yeah, for me, it was, go for me, it was the Chili Peppers, the Rolling Stones. Or <laughs> Fucking, but definitely the chili true, peppers though. fucking got me. It and then and then also Taco Cabana chicken quesadillas. Oh, dog. Oh, they are so good. And cheese tacos. But they're not really that good. <laughs> they're not. You got to be on drugs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There's the, you have those experiences. All right, Kyle, you go up in for, uh, into the pre-tragic and then we'll go into the tragic stage. I grew up kind of similar to KT in that drugs were bad and K kind of vibe. Both my parents did <laughs> okay. quite a bit of drugs and never told me that until I was older, which was comical. But they would withhold all that. And it's and it's dumb, right? Because like is. if they would have just told you, you could have had like a head start. Yeah, like this is where these into the are fucking good, tragic this is where yourself. these aren't good. You know, this yeah, is exactly. where it can go south, that kind of thing. My parents got divorced at 13. And because my mom knew I was going to drink no matter what, she said, I'd rather you drink here at the house than, right. than go off and get drunk and get in a car accident. So we had a little bit of leeway there. And that she came to that decision, not on her own. She came to that decision because I was getting drunk at other places at 13 and, and showing up drunk. <clears throat> Mad Dog 2020, St. Ives Special <laughs> Brew, <laughs> Gold Schlager. There was another shitty one, uh, Aftershock. That was another oh, shitty God, cinnamon drink. Yeah. So we got into all that stuff. Uh, I had many... I have many memories uh, that came up for me in ayahuasca later where I was asking ayahuasca, why wouldn't my sister do ayahuasca with me? And it showed me all the times I had introduced a drug to her <laughs> wow. and gone completely over the rails. So like literally I'm in my chonies hanging over a railing, barfing, saying, get the fuck away. I don't want you to see me like this. Like at 15 years old, 16 years old, 17 yeah. years old. Yeah. Um, so I, and I, you know, I, I went hard to the paint right from the jump. So I kind of experienced hangovers like that. But yeah. when you're young, it's like you just bounce right back from it. You know, like I get hung over and I'm like, worth it. Totally fucking worth it. And um, 
there was no real meter there, you know, and, and I looked at people who did other drugs like cannabis and psilocybin, and a lot of them were like the skater community where I was like, I don't want to wind up a loser like these guys, you know? <laughs> so I was like, I'm not going to fuck with those. Um, I dabbled a little bit with cannabis. When I got to college at ASU, all bets were off. I, I started working with cannabis pretty early, like in junior college. And that was really, it was, it was, it was addictive. It was, uh, um, it was a crutch and a numbing agent, but it was the most beautiful. It's kind of like a Russell Brand talks about it. Like it was a beautiful numbing agent for me in that time of my life. And, uh, and then at ASU, it was cocaine and ecstasy and shoving pills in my poop shoot and fucking <laughs> all bets are off. You know, those are the good old days. Number one party school in the nation. And then uh, my, I had, had a few poor experiences with plant medicines, but when I left college and got into fighting in the UFC, my boxing coach, Wheatsy, was yeah. the first to introduce me to plant medicines. And that kind of shifted the trajectory of everything. Right. And there's a, you know, there's an interesting pre-tragic stage to plant medicines where people think that any plant medicine is a good, is a good idea. And it's like, it's holy water. And the more holy water you have, the better. And you can yeah. really run into some, you know, gnarly, dangerous territory on that side of the yeah, game too. And we've been there. Sure. So we can follow that thread, you know, if that ends up coming up through this conversation. It's certainly uh, one of the subjects I explore at length in my upcoming book, Psychonaut, which talks particularly about the plant medicine side, but talks also about where the lines got blurred with recreation and where, you know, some medicines were being used as drugs, et cetera. But there's the same arc in the medicine journey as well, where you realize like, oh, this is all good. This is all, oh, this is, this is potentially dangerous. You can wind up in night school like, like Kyle did and, and, you know, a two year recovery from, you know, different things that can happen on these yeah. medicines. Right. And so mm -hmm. then there's a tragic, and then there's the post tragic of like what you learned, what you gather and what you come back from. Mm -hmm. So, all right. So then speaking into, again, the pre-tragic of, of this situation, I think one of the things worth mentioning is, you know, you mentioned drunk driving. My cousin, Eric was killed when I was like 16, you know, and in a drunk driving accident, he wasn't drunk, but somebody else was. And I fucking loved Eric. Like I loved him. He was like the best of us. He was like all my other cousins, you know, and my stepbrothers, they were cool sometimes. They're assholes sometimes, you know, but Eric was like, he was the fucking best. Like I looked up to him. He's a college athlete, just like such a good dude. And I remember just fucking being devastated, just absolutely devastated. I still have a picture of Eric in my meditation room altar, you know, that I'll go in and I'll, you know, say hi to him. And this is a, one of my first experiences with death. And it was linked to one of the tragedies of alcohol, which is the danger that can come from decision-making, including driving cars. So I think that early baptism in the danger of that, you know, I haven't had you know, dangerous alcohol related situations. Cause I was very fucking, I was very wounded by the tragic mm. early yeah. and I learned that. So I always stayed away from drunk driving. I had parents who also like you were like, listen, I don't care how fucked up you are anywhere in the, anywhere in the country, if you need a fucking ride, you know, even if you, you know, didn't tell us what you were doing, whatever you lied your whole way there, you lie and you don't fucking, you can lie your whole way back. Doesn't matter. We'll give you a ride, you know, yeah, and yeah. we're not going to punish you for that. <clears throat> so to teach you. So those were some good aspects that I think are important because if you have a policy where you're going to punish somebody, if they're out drinking and they're, that's really going to be it. Well, they're just going to hide it from you by whatever means necessary, which includes driving somewhere where see, they won't get I caught. I saw that so much like almost all of my friends because their parents would you know punish them for it they would lie and they would drive drunk yeah and i think we lie also when we're afraid even like because my parents weren't condemning they weren't encouraging but it's also just the whole atmosphere of the world that we're in is this is bad and so even if your parents might be more open to you just being honest there's just so much pressure, at least there was when I was younger. Um, I can't speak to what it's like to be in that coming of age time right now, but we, that's one of the real, the, this, these things that society feels like it's protecting, but it's actually creating an atmosphere where people are more inclined to lie and conceal the truth of who they are and what they're doing and end up coming to more harm paradoxically. Yeah. So that's what I felt like I experienced was like, I can't, I can't talk about this because everyone would judge me. Yeah. 
All right. So let me go, let me go tour now into, uh, again, also some pre-tragic experiences with uh, sacred plant medicines. My first vision quest at 18, I didn't actually experience the tragic, any tragic aspects of that probably until <sighs> of like really doing the ceremonial work. It started to get a little sketch, you know, probably in my 30s, where I started to run into places that were dangerous places, places that if I took this off ramp, I would have ended up in some kind of psychosis that would have lasted a certain amount of time. And I found myself in certain, you know, psychotically broken situations for yeah. short periods of time, but also, you know, they helped, they helped me along. So it took me a while for the sacred medicine path to actually reveal the tragic. So, but the other the other aspects of the tragic that came in you know as i started to get exposed to other drugs so one of the drugs that i was exposed to was ghb <laughs> and that was like <clears throat> hallelujah when i found it first of all it has a horrible reputation because it's like the date rape drug so like even if you talked about it somebody thought you were being sketchy but i was just giving it to myself like that was, <laughs> that was wanted to date rape myself because it was like it was so it, most it's a, people it, don't know what it does so yeah you... so ghb is a is a gaba agonist that used to be you know a pharmaceutical that could be prescribed i actually think it still might be a pharmaceutical they still do it for sleep apnea and things like that yeah um so it's a gaba agonist which is the same as alcohol fundamentally but it doesn't have um all of the kind of really toxic effects of like the downstream effects of alcohol that include like acid aldehyde and all of the different inf inflammatory processes hangover. so you can actually yeah the hangover so you can actually experience what it feels like to be drunk like the good aspects of quote good feeling aspects of being drunk without the downside now you're still going to get a pretty savage glutamate rebound which is the kind of opposite neurotransmitter to GABA so a GABA agonist means you're creating more of it so alcohol is creating more GABA in your brain. GHB is creating more GABA in your brain. And that GABA is a, you know, kind of disinhibition, dis, disinhibitor, right. you know, of your expression. Um, and unlike alcohol too, it's a very, it's very pleasurable to have sex on GHB. It like feels, it kind of connects you to your animality in a way. Can confirm. And very quickly you start to discover the tragic because this is playing with fucking fire and i want to mention this we have you know at least caitlin and i in particular have friends who know somebody who's very close to them who died you know mm -hmm. from a ghb overdose and i both experienced and known people who've what's called quote g'd out which is they've taken too much and they're completely non-responsive and it's a very sketchy fucking situation and i don't know anybody who's played with this drug that hasn't gotten fucked up or know some situation that was a little fucked up it is one of the most you're really fucking playing with fire and you really got to be fucking careful if you decide to play with this now again this is not a fucking disclaimer encouragement, disclaimer. encouragement yeah. to do this i'm saying if you are and if this is if you're around it be aware it can feel very good yes we know it we get it i understand why you're doing it i fucking understand i promise and i've also seen both personally and some really kind of sketchy situations arise from that particular drug so that's kind of the down also there's different types of ghb one of the worst situations i got myself in is that there's some GHB that you kind of feel it in this kind of tingling in your feet after about 40 minutes, it kicks in. Some types that take like an hour and a half and then can send you on this really much longer ride. And actually you can start to learn to taste the difference. I don't know the actual chemical molecules that are different, but it's like butyrate or gamma hydroxybutyrate or butylene or butyl, there's like different ways like 5-MeO you know, DMT or NN DMT, it's still DMT, but it's, it's acting in a much different way. So you don't know exactly what you're getting because there's not like a, you're getting it from the fucking streets. You know what I mean? So it's intense and sketchy to, to play with that, to play with that drug and definitely learn that lesson. So that lesson, that lesson was learned. And then, you know, back in our days, Caitlin, we were partying a lot, you know, we, we were trying to do Molly a lot and, you know, oftentimes the experience with molly was fucking great 
you know, my mm-hmm. first, most of my first experiences were really, really great. But, and then sometimes you could do too much and that's not so great. Um, but not as terrible as when you try to do Molly and you're not doing Molly, yeah. <laughs> which is like what one time we did fucking crystal meth yeah. on accident. Th- thought we were doing, thought yeah, we, and thought it was we were the doing. bath salts era. And it was also the, and also there was the bath salts yeah. that were coming in and being, being distributed as Molly. So you don't know what the fuck you're getting. Was that a 72 hour mistake? <laughs> oh yeah. The, well, On the, Christmas Eve. Oh God. The, the, yeah. <laughs> the, the fucking meth situation was like, that was the worst. Cause we all, I mean, at a certain point in the after party, we recognized that there was a certain crowd that came in right around dawn that was just on a different program. You never want the dawn <laughs> and it was like It was always a little sketchy. You think but, you do. Yeah. <laughs> You're like, like, there's a dawn crowd. We can keep going. <laughs> so, yeah. but the fucking dawn crowd, you know, somebody in the dawn crowd, you know, was like, oh yeah, we have some more Molly if you guys want. We're like, all right, we'll have a little bit more. But it was like, it was in shards. And we're like, it's really, and it's like, oh yeah, it's like crystalline. No, nah, bro, it's fucking meth. Yeah. And so we took it and it was the worst experience the I've worst. ever had. Like we were just up and up and up and up. And I felt like I was losing my fucking mind. And mm-hmm. it was a fucking nightmare mm-hmm. experience. Mm-hmm. Like absolutely. So, um, and then, you know, my experience with cocaine, I never, it never really took to me. I never really liked it. I felt like, I feel like a little cool, a little talkative, but I don't like what it does to the, to the energy of yeah. of the place that I'm in. And also we would always, like when there was cocaine involved, we always got in a fight. And then we would get in fights about getting in fights <laughs> about cocaine, right? So like we would start fighting the immediately. Cocaine wouldn't even have to, devil. it didn't even have, to, <laughs> didn't even have to go up your nose until we were actually fighting about co- oh, yeah. cocaine was making us fight, right? Like it was, so I started to really see the tragedy of that without ever actually getting into and still to this day, it's like one of those things that, you know, I have a little bit of mambe, you know, in my mouth sometimes, but that's the coca leaf ground up. It's the same as the coca tea you get in Peru. And it's, there's, there's different ways to access that, that I think are a lot healthier, but that was kind of my first foray into, uh, into the tragic element of these kind of drugs slash medicines. Yeah. I would say my tragic period with drugs if you know which can also also always be medicines depending on how you hold them um for the most part i would maybe someone could argue against crystal meth <laughs> um but uh, my my tragic period was very long i would say it was probably i didn't really transcend the tragic relationship with it until about you know a few years ago i think my first big wake up. There were so many wake up calls that tried to happen, but essentially I went from loving the sensation of myself with particular intoxicants, alcohol, cocaine. Um, I was certainly, I've always been an uppers person. And I know that this um, reading Gabor Mate's In the Realm of Hungry Ghosts has been really supportive for me. And also reading Scattered Minds, which is about ADHD, but it's essentially the development of my prefrontal cor- cortex has is structured in such a way where I'm I have less impulse control, and um, that's something that was problematic in school, and you know all of these things. And I'm just like excitement driven, so anything that sparked excitement in me, I had a very hard time stopping, and that was the real tipping point. <laughs> <laughs> It's so sad, right? <laughs> you did have a, yeah. it was quite you had a very hard time but I had stopping. A very hard time stopping, and very it was like, and stopping. I would get hell bent on keeping going until my body just wouldn't go on, and it would be like essentially anything that would get me up, which if that was MDMA or cocaine or whatever, um, really those were the two that I really f- had the most fun on. But then I could drink more. And so it would be this constant dance of, oh, I feel too high. I better drink some more. And now I feel too drunk. So I better do some more stuff to like seek this balance where I was still having a good time until my body just wouldn't go on. And this like actually in some ways to honor the blend of like pre-tragic and tragic, it actually brought me into certain 
realms of embodiment that I don't know if I ever would have found them otherwise. That's a good point. You know, uh, the confidence to dance on a table in the night in a nightclub and just be like loving people and bringing joy to people and being super crazy and like, you know, surprising people. And I was always like a maestra of the party, you know, and I loved that feeling about myself. And I loved it so much that I never wanted it to stop. And that has a huge Just imagine that Caitlin's, <laughs> Caitlin's radical, heart open, benevolent, beneficent, beautiful, loving energy with then ever increasing percentages of Harley Quinn. <laughs> just, <laughs> just, <laughs> went, just, went, just fucking went up over and I, over and I over. Connect until, to her. <laughs> yeah, until she was in a fully regressed state of just her pure mm -hmm. five-year-old demiurge. <laughs> yes, like, but this is the part of the mysteries that's really fascinating. I still medit like, meditate on it. I, I ponder it, this like streak of like wild Dionysian madness that I actually love to feel at times as part of the full spectrum of my beingness. And that took me to places where I blacked out and didn't know how I got places that I was. I remember specifically one night, my last memory, driving up to Taco Bell and saying, I don't have any money. Can I have some food? <laughs> And hitting a median and somebody picked me up off the side of the road and took me to my mother's house where I threw up on the floor and passed out on the couch. And so that was all, I was only like 22. That was before I even met you. Uh, and then this, this would happen periodically where it was like this earth shaking thing where um, my impulse, my drive for this like ever receding horizon of fulfillment in you know, my intoxication would take me to the darkest places and I would, you know, effectively destroy relationships, humiliate myself, which created a shame spiral, which drove me to want to distance myself from my emotion. <laughs> it's just so entertained over here and I love it. I love it. It makes it light. It's true. It's like it, there were comic. I know what you're thinking about. <laughs> so for those of you who don't know, Caitlin and, I, Caitlin and I were, we were engaged. We were in a romantic relationship for six years from when I was like 24 to 30 uh -huh. and you were like 22, what? 23 to 29. Yeah. So we we have a lot of funny stories. And, it was the and, heyday. <laughs> and so. this one story doesn't actually involve a lot of doesn't involve a lot of substances other than absinthe. So we're in Prague. Oh, that one. Yeah. I was thinking of the oh, penguin. Oh, you're thinking of the penguin? <laughs> well, the penguin. The penguin's a whole nother story. That's where her mouth was actually black and frothy and her Google face Batman was ghost, forever. Or ghost, Batman too. ghost white. She was just like bubbling ochre saliva at the corner of her mouth and just fucking losing her mind. But that one wasn't as funny as His when... As when <laughs> that one was as funny as when we were in Prague and we did like a bunch of shots of absinthe at Goldfinger Strip Club and you got so drunk that we were with our buddy Mike and you kept going punch punch I turned into a toddler <laughs> and like and like punching him point. and then we got out there and and you made like uh we, we had an amazing time but then eventually you got to this completely regressed stage where you were you're walking through the streets of Prague, just screaming at the top of your lungs. I pee pee in my pants. I pee pee in my pants. I have a strong suspicion that something in toddlerhood happened with pee and it, it, it like guides all of my addiction. <laughs> and I'm still don't understand oh, it. Oh man. Yeah. I would, I would get like that. And the thing that was really tough for me, I think. <laughs> and then the fun, I got to finish the story. You're <laughs> funniest part of the story she gets i get her back up to the hotel room she's punching bushes she's yelling in the street uh, people in prague are used to it because people are always there fucking partying balls so we get into the room and and uh and like i get her into the door and then i'm closing the door and she just passes out like on the floor and i was like i was, I was like I'm going to take a picture. I'm going to, I'm going to set up a picture here. <laughs> and so, and so her pants were kind of like, her skirt was kind of like falling down. So I just gave her like the 
biggest front wedgie. Just the biggest <laughs> camel toe wedgie. And he told me this. And I took a picture day. of it. I took a picture of it. And I was like, Casey, you'll never believe how you passed out. <laughs> and, and, we would sh- and I would show that picture. And then with our closest friends, I would show that picture. <laughs> And then, and then so for like six years. Yes, worst hangover of my life, Paris Airport. I felt like I was literally dying. And then there was that picture to capture everything that I missed. And this this memory of the the camel toe of of my ultimate debauchery stayed with me for so many years. And it wasn't until way after we broke up, way after we didn't see each other for years. And we like reconnected and became friends. He was like, oh, that I did that. Yeah, that was, that was, uh, <laughs> Just that was, imagine, you're in a state where someone can give you a front wedgie. Like that was my, that was my rhythm. Oh, man. But yeah, it was, uh, so this, this alludes to just to bring in medicines a little bit, because uh, my first big deep dive with plant medicines was going to do Iboga. And mm. a lot of the impetus, which Iboga is a massive, Iboga is used um, pretty widely for hair, you know, kind opiate of addiction. healing opiate addiction. Yes. Um, and there was this kind of felt experience between us in our relationship at that time, which was, we were both aware that I had an, a real issue with having an off switch. And it was really tough because I got so much positive validation because for the most part, I was delightful except for some rare moments. So it was like, I was accessing this part of myself. Everyone loved her. Everyone wanted to hang out with her and for her to come to their parties. And so it was even harder for me to extricate like who I am and who, what I love in myself without all of these substances um, and we went to do Iboga together, which was right before we broke up. But it was really kind of um, my first attempt, my first brave attempt to bridge this this disconnect that I had with substances into, you know, where I now sit, with, which is in a healthy relationship with substances and plants as medicine. But I went there to to fix myself in this way that took me a very long time. Um, very long time. That was 2012. And it, I don't think my real breakthroughs where the the screams got loud enough for me to make the changes that I need to make happened for another seven years. So yeah, I'll let other people share a little bit, but there was a lot of, there was a lot of tragedy for me and it was a hard relationship to transform because of all of the the positive feelings and the intricacies of the of the hooks that it had in my system to get that positive validation and to feel excited about life, which is ultimately what it just opened my heart even more, but but to the point where I was destroying myself a lot of the time. And one of the stories that I'm remembering just listening to all of this that I actually forgot was um, a different type of pre-tragic, tragic, post-tragic that I think a lot of people will resonate with was when I was a senior in high school, I was in a weird situation where I lived alone in a house and I tore my rotator cuff and it was the end of my basketball career and I got surgery. And this was back in like the heyday of Oxycontin. And I got prescribed something like a four to six month supply of Oxycontin. And I lived alone. I didn't have the insight to know that I was depressed. And I got to the point where I would skip breakfast. I would take two pills. I would drive to school and I could time it where the moment I would park, I would be high. I'd be high all day at school. All my teachers and my friends could tell because like I was the like class clown that would always like argue with the teacher and I just like stopped speaking. And the photos of me from that period in my life are, are tough to look at. And because I didn't know anything like my pre-tragic state was, well, if the doctor gave it to me, it's, mm. it's, it's good. Mm-hmm. And after I ran out, I didn't know anything about it being addictive. And I, so I just started eating and eating to try to like replace that Mm -hmm. opioid and I gained like 40 pounds and I was like 220 pounds I was 40 pounds heavier it was terrible and I remember looking at myself in the mirror and taking a photo and being like this is the moment that I'm gonna like heal myself 
And so like the pre-tragic was, well, if the doctor gave it to me, it's good. The tragic was like, I lost a year of my life that I can barely remember like what happened my senior year. Like I have a photo from me at prom and I'm in a, like a big sling and I just look ridiculous. Like I just look like I'm not even there. But the beautiful thing was the post tragic of that is that's the thing that sparked me to start to like do my own research and to like learn about how to eat and to like learn how to work out. And it, it changed my life, but it was fucking terrible. Mm. And I think a lot of people in our country, like it's less so now, but before the rise of the internet really started to expose this stuff, millions of people are like, you know, if a doctor prescribes it, it's good. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Adderall, same thing. Yeah. You know, lots of these different, lots of these different drugs that are just from a different drug dealer. Right. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Yeah, I have a similar tragic in college, got to a point where um, I had a really dope, depending on how you look at it, naturopathic doctor who gave me anything I asked for. So I had 60... 10 milligram Valium, 62 milligram Xanax, 60 Vicodin, the Norcos, which I didn't wow. even like. I would just trade those for ecstasy and shit with different people on the team. And, um, and I told him what I was doing. I was like, hey, man, I have trouble going to sleep after cocaine and alcohol. So we started with <laughs> wow. Xanax and Valium. And um, Valium was great if I just wanted to chill. And, and, you know, these things work so well on quelling anxiety but the second you come off of them all that shit's still there that like you've done no work right. to clean the closet you just stuff more shit in the closet shove, shovel more stuff under the rug yeah and uh i'd really put myself on like learning everything that i've learned now through my fight career and beyond on neurochemistry why sleep matters what's actually happening in the body when you lose sleep all those things i set myself on a course where i wasn't using shit every night but every weekend i'd have two or three days where i'd go out and we'd stay up late and I'd use chemicals to get up and chemicals to get down. And that went on long enough. And then I kind of hit rock bottom in a relationship that I was in where I really felt like at my core, I was never going to be loved. Mm. And, and it, and it happened we were at a bowling alley and I was being obnoxious, being me in air quotes, you know, and, uh, it really turned her off. And I just thought, well, if she doesn't like that and she doesn't like who I am, you know? And so I went home and basically just took every pill that I had left. And thankfully, I didn't have enough to die from it. But I took them all. I drove to the top of parking lot 7 at ASU. I stripped down and I got ready to jump. And I felt for like clearly for the first time in my life, I felt another presence. And it just washed over me. And that might have been all the chemicals kicking in, but I just felt not yet. And this not yet to me meant the peace that I'm looking for is guaranteed, but not yet. Your life doesn't end yet. And right when that washed over me, I was like, oh shit. And then the guard looked up at me and he goes, oh shit, you're naked. And I was like, oh, there's a guy down there. <laughs> and he's like, can you, uh, can you come down? And I was like, yeah, uh, I got clothes. I brought a robe. So I threw the robe on and I came down and I brought a robe. 36 hours later, I woke up in a hospital. My family had all flown out from California. Wow. And uh, that was like the first time where I really got to hash out a lot of buried shit that I had buried from my childhood. And, you know, the therapists there were great. They said, don't expect your family to acknowledge what you're saying. Don't expect an apology. Don't expect anything, but say it because you need to say it. And so that was great because a lot of shit wasn't heard in the way that I thought it would be, but I just still voiced it anyways. I voiced all the stuff that I dealt with. And that was alleviating in many respects. But what that period of time did that week that I was there is it burst the bubble of all the should do's. You know, I was done with football. It was my senior year at ASU. I should finish college so I can get a job in a cubicle. I should do this. I should do that. All that vanished in that state. And the first time I was able to ask myself, what do I want to do? And so I didn't know what I wanted to be when I grew up, but I started tracking what I missed. And what I missed was my teammates. I miss camaraderie. I miss sport. I miss being an athlete. And that led me to training in mixed martial arts, which very quickly led me to fight career. Won my first couple fights in under 30 seconds. And then it was like, all right, now I got to take care of myself. And fighting was beautiful because I hadn't exercised the demons fully. I still love to party hard. 
Uh, but like you, Cates, I had a hard time saying no when it was game on. I was like, fucking game on. Let's go. I just fought win or lose. It's time to fucking party. <laughs> I've been a good boy for eight weeks. I've been meditating, doing breath work, hitting saunas and ice baths. I've earned the right to get fucked up. And so in fighting, I really lived like a pretty polarized life where half the year in camp, I was perfect, not even watching TV, just reading books, learning, doing all the things my body wanted. And then the other half, it was total debauchery. And, and I kind of went back and forth on that, really trying to fine tune where is this right way to party? Where is the right relation? And it was thankfully that I had a coach that led me through the plant medicine path that became to illuminate in layers and in layers and in layers and in layers um, what I was doing to myself without anyone else having to say it. It couldn't come from someone else. It had to come from within. Mm -hmm. And ayahuasca revealed that. But it was, I mean, 10 journeys in, my 10th journey, I had that vision where I saw, what, why does my sister not want to do medicine with me? You know, and I was like, oh shit, there's hundreds of experiences, wow. right? Like I used to get liquid ketamine and spray weed down and sun dry it and I'd roll joints and fucking get people blasted like Ari Shafir. I wouldn't tell him it was queed, <laughs> ketamine weed. Queen. Don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, there was, there was yeah. I mean, I, I went hard to the paint and plant medicines allowed me to see for myself what I was doing to myself. But that's, that's more on the post tragic. The tragic was, you know, coming close to ending my own life. The tragic was introducing my teammates to their first hit of ecstasy, first Vicodin pill. And then over time, watching them get into Oxycontin. And then over time, watching that turn to heroin when they couldn't get more Oxycontin and then OD and die, you know, three people in college from ASU died from a heroin overdose. And two of them, I was the guy that introduced them to partying. I introduced them to drugs, you know, and that's a, that was a hard pill to swallow. Yeah. The tragic is real. It's very real. Like it's, it's real, you know, and that's the thing to know. It's not just an illusory stage. There is a real tragic stage. And sometimes the tragedy is not lack of clarity. Sometimes the tragedy is permanent tragedy. Yeah. You know, and that's, <clears throat> and that's really important for people to understand is that the, the guidance against it is, is true, but partial. And, and what we're trying to say here is it's not that that's not true, that this has extreme danger, but also we have to talk about the allurement we have to talk about. And then also the integration of how to actually reclaim these things. It's something that like Dr. Carl Hart, talks about yeah when he talks about you know it's not just legalization of psychedelics but legalization of all drugs based on some fundamental principles of you know the sovereignty of our own consciousness and also he's trying to dissolve the split between these are medicines and these are drugs and say it all depends on context it depends on your intention depends on who you are depends on the context no matter what and i think he's done kind of a he's been the like the lone champion of that of that voice but i think it's an important voice carry and, and i find a lot of truth to what he's saying in that you know there may be certain things where i just can't devise a context where my body and that substance would actually mix in a way that that is anything that's remotely productive or beneficial or positive so that's just that but that's just me i can't say that that's the reality for anybody in any given situation you know i mean there's i mean fuck you could imagine like you know, and I think there's better ways to do it. But if you're on a, you know, three night overnight mission and you have to stay awake or you and your platoon are going to die and all you have is some fucking street meth that you pulled off somebody else that you, you know, found in combat or whatever. And you're like, fuck, you either stay awake or die. You know, like, I can fully imagine like right. there's situations, you know, so and that's why I want to keep the field available to understand that there is context and situation and this is the this is ultimately the hebrew way is to like find the nuance like people like ari shafir and his hilarious comedy special jew and of course if you don't know i'm of like hebrew lineage i'm really connecting with that more and more but there's the torah which is like the bible and like the kind of the guiding principles that they operate in like the divine uh, like the, the commandments and these other things that are also, you know, the lessons that are contained within uh, within the ancient scriptures. And then there's the Talmud, which the Talmud is basically Jewish masters kind of arguing about what is what is the right way and what is the wrong way. And Ari Shafir points out this hilarious story about arguing about how much ham, because in the kosher law, you're not allowed to eat pork, how much ham you have to have in your soup before you throw away the soup 
and they ultimately determine it's one sixtieth ham. Anything more than one sixtieth <laughs> ham, you got to throw away the soup. Otherwise, you eat the soup. And but the, it's funny if you look at it patently. But what it's actually teaching is it's teaching that everything has nuance. 100%. And that's what that group of masters in figuring it out, working it out, trying to understand it, being guided by what they felt like was the divine principle, but then actually being willing to wrestle with the nuance. And we all have an urge to just declare things, stay in the pre-tragic, declare things black or white, good or bad, and you know, guilty, innocent, all of these things. We try to be in this really clear pre-tragic stage where when you start to mature in your consciousness, which is something that's actually taught in the in the Hebrew lineage is, and that's I think one of the beautiful aspects of this tradition is it's teaching you to look for nuance and it's teaching you you know to re- quote wrestle with God, which right. means basically you got to figure it out together, like you and the divine are working this thing out together. And I think that's a huge insight that's missed a lot in our culture that's predominantly Christian, where it's like for most people there is no wrestling with god right it's whatever version of god was given to you that's the rule book yeah that. yeah and that's that's so and that's the same case and it's the same case with there's new age new age fundamentalism as well for sure where like all non-ceremonial use of medicines is bad mm-hmm. no matter what you know and then i think so what i want to talk about is where that started to really where i started to see the nuance of the difference and i started to you know, be able to experiment with psilocybin at like a dance party and then a little psilocybin with, and we would go to our raves and we would have like a little bit of MDMA and a little bit of psilocybin at a, at a rave. Mm-hmm. And it'd just be like fucking unbelievable. We're just feeling the bass pumping and the, this this magical universe of this, you know, festival in a rodeo barn or in a fucking yeah. field somewhere. Skrillex was just coming online and we were, he was blowing our mind with songs and we got to be his friend through a crazy situation and then we're on stage with him and we're feeling like, and that experience of ecstasis was actually just pure medicine. It, yeah. was, it was medicine to tap us into the joy and the ecstasy of life and how beautiful life can be. And then the shared ecstasis of the field, when you're in the field of that. I mean, you think of the old bacchanalias and the orgiastic rituals that when you say orgy, everybody thinks sex. Sometimes it includes sex. Sometimes it's just like actually like a fucking festival. Right. You know, where you're generating this, cultivating this group energy. And this has been done with intention by By all all, all cultures. All the old cultures. Throughout the history of humanity. Yep. Hebrew cultures. And wiped out and distorted by this puritanized, Mm -hmm. um, you know, oppressive ideology that came through really a lot with fundamental Christianity, especially in America. And in 2023, you have to almost choose to be ignorant of the evidence that this has been going on for thousands of years in every major living culture that we have record of. And yep. that it was sacred. Holy. Yes. It was holy. It temples they recognized, it. they recognized the feeling that was created was of God. It was of life. It, this, there was like real life force. And I'm sure they also recognized the shadow of, of those experiences as well. They had the tragic aspect of but they didn't have the pre-tragic fundamentalist view. They probably had a post-tragic, you know, more post-tragic view where they recognized, all right, here are the bounds, you know, and maybe it wasn't as developed from our own awareness of science and our own awareness of the specifics of what we're taking, et cetera. But so I started to kind of understand that the line between ceremony and recreation started to get blurred. And, you know, when I think of some of the best experiences of my life, a lot of them was like doing psilocybin while skiing with my friends and mm-hmm. just connecting and feeling the mountain and feeling the crisp air and the snow and and then laughing on the fucking chair and then ripping down a ripping down a, a run <clears throat> with everybody and then laughing and howling at the bottom and, and then finding those quiet moments where the music's just hitting and the sun's yeah. over the peak and it's just like unbelievable experiences that happen there, which, what is that? Is that recreation or is that ceremony? You know, mm-hmm. same thing at, same thing at Burning Man. You're constantly blurring the lines between that. And actually the place where I've arrived now, so my last two birthdays, which I get to be the maestro, it's my fucking birthday. <laughs> right? And fortunately I have great maestros like Caitlin who helped me kind of plan it out and Vayu helped me plan it Make out. Make sure there's enough glitter. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so my last two birthdays were a perfect example of this continual blurred line between 
ceremony and party where all of a sudden, you know, we're from this kind of crazy, wild, sexy dance party situation, playing games and laughing to then blues leading this deep prayer and this healing and then moving energy. And I'm feeling everybody push energy into my body. And I'm having this like five MEO experience, not with any five MEO, but just feeling the energy of it in my body. And then I <clears throat> drop into my own prayer. Same thing with my last birthday, my 42nd birthday. You know, we're in the, having this crazy wild celebration in the hotel room. And then we go into the one of the other rooms and I start telling the story. That's where I told the story of the fourth six and my father. And like that one was of the deep, most powerful moments. Yeah, like I've deep ceremony and then yeah. popping out. And then what are we doing again? It's lingerie and dance party and like fun and our best friends. And it's the best, you know, it's the best time. But it's so we, I've found a way to really kind of blur, blur those lines for myself and understand that each one has its distinct lane where sometimes it's purely ceremony. It's like you're really in it. Ayahuasca has been that way. I've never recreationally done ayahuasca. <laughs> Although the last Eric ayahuasca does. session, we, we <laughs> Eric, Eric, that's a hilarious Just story kidding. on accident. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, but and then there's certain times where it's like, yeah, no, clearly this is just, this is just for recreational purposes. I just want to take a brief moment to let everybody know that we're back again with the Arcadia Festival of a More Beautiful World, November two through five, Area 15 in Nevada. And our lineup this year is insane. We have actually, literally, my dream lineup of artists and speakers, including like Chromio, The Glitch Mob, Floozies, Dr. Fresh, Troy Boy, Elderbrook, Jai Wolf, Desert Dwellers, Parangi, Vailana, Makad Brooks, The Human Experience. I mean, the music is out of control. On the main stage, I'll be speaking. Mama Gina will be speaking. Del Big Tree will be speaking. In Q, the greatest living poet, in my opinion, will be speaking. And we got Matias De Stefano. We have Blue. We have so many unbelievable speakers and unbelievable experiences at the Area 15 property out there in Nevada, which is also mind-blowing and awe-inspiring and just a beautiful community of people that are there to make a stand for life to make a stand for celebrating our sovereignty our freedom our love our joy our ecstasis our play and wrap it in a container where we get to actually stand together facing a shared horizon and say we are here we are here we are here we're going to blow this away. Anybody who comes, I promise you, it's going to be an unforgettable experience. And I just can't wait to see you guys there. So if you're interested, tickets are going extremely fast. Go to fitforservice.com slash Arcadia with a K and check it out. There's a few different ticket options, whether you just want to attend for the festivities at night or if you want to be part of the full immersive speaker program. Or if you want to help with a lifetime membership and be a builder of what Arcadia not only is now, but will be for many years into the future. So once again, fitforservice.com slash Arcadia with a K. I can't wait to see you guys there. But I've always, I've always had this, and I think, Caitlin, you can attest this. I've always had this. I even wrote an old, old blog post that was Party With Your Third Eye Open, which is like, don't ever lose that level of consciousness. Like, I always wanted to be... Like if the king archetype within me needed to show up, that he was on duty. Right. And if the warrior archetype needed to show up, which it did that one time we got in that horrific street fight with those four fucking guys, mm -hmm. like at the end of a long night, <clears throat> long night of partying at the club, like if the king needed to show up, if the warrior needed to show up, if the lover needed to show up, those are some of the most tragic, actually, when the lover needed to show up, but if the lover did too many drugs and the lover mm. couldn't show up, I was like, oh, this is <laughs> the worst. We'll no, let the audience no over that. This, this is resuscitation going to take place. The, this is the worst. <laughs> I remember one time, man, that was bad. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> but, but in either case, like you learn those lessons. Of, like I wanted to have the mm -hmm. full capacity and also the magician, the ability to change and alchemize the energy of a situation with the application of the right energy or the application of the right words or to recognize that the situation needs to be changed. Right. right? Exactly. That's not common. Exactly. Yeah. So I always, I always had a kind of a, an intuitive knack for that type of party. And it didn't mean that I wouldn't fall and fuck up and make mistakes along the way. But, um, you, you don't know. get to this point if you don't trip 
a couple of times. Yeah. And then just be honest and learn about it and then recognize <laughs> it and then really look at it and look at like, how did that happen? You know, where did that happen? Why did that happen? You know, and, and also understand that as, as your experience with medicines change and you understand it different, like for me, ketamine and alcohol have a very weird relationship that it's not very good, you know, fundamentally. And so I've like experienced ketamine, alcohol, cannabis together, and it's been fucking horrible. Yeah. You know, it's like the alcohol God bomb and it's terrible. <laughs> You know what Oof. I mean? Like it's not, it's not, it doesn't really work that well. And I've, so even in, even in my maturity understanding, like I know all of these medicines so well, sometimes the combinations are like, no, this combination is actually fucked. Like be really mindful with your like how in the order, even early, like, how, you know, rape, which is tobacco, tobacco and ketamine, you know, you can get super fucking nauseous if you try to combine those two early. Sometimes you can get adapted, but there's just different ways to understand how these things actually work together or don't work together. Some of them have like dangerous, actually biological and, and, you know, kind of yeah. chemical reactions. And some of them are just going to create an experience that is a little wobbly. Like for me, cannabis and psilocybin is a dangerous combination to play 100%. with, you know, like, cause, cause it can really spin you out into some anxious, dis, you know, disoriented, confusing places that I've seen a lot of things go squirrely with that particular combination. Yeah. Whereas with like MDMA and psilocybin in the right combination, you know, which is my first medicine journey, like that typically is a very good pairing. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like MDMA brings the energy up into your heart center and kind of this airy energy you want to talk and this psilocybin brings you down and you feel safe into the ground. The yeah, mm -hmm. and, and then, you know, your crown can open up and, so there's a whole kind of field of, of understanding that you get, but you just have to be really mind mindful that, you know, these are, you're playing in, you're playing in, in treacherous waters, you yeah. know, you're surfing on the open ocean and there's ways you can fall in every direction. And if you're able to navigate it and desire it, then there's ways that you can do it that are like a boss. And then there's ways that you can do it like a rookie. Yeah. And then other people have to take care of you. You're diminishing the energy of the, of the environment that you're in. You're taking away from the experience, from your experience and from everyone else around you. And, you know, we see that, we see that all the time. And we've, we've selected ourselves to be in groups where people, if they're going to be on medicines and again, no pressure to be on any medicines, but if you are fucking handle your shit, right? Mm -hmm. you know what I mean? Like we're not here to, we didn't go through all of these lessons ourselves to be you know, holding your hand as you learn them along the way, like be mindful, handle your shit, minimum effective dose. Like if you don't think you can handle your shit, stay the fuck away from, from this. If you don't know what you're doing. And, and that's also a key thing is just being super mindful of any type of peer pressure that could push someone out of their comfort zone, you know, and get them to a place where they're not actually going to be comfortable. That could even be alcohol. Yeah. I mean, we're the mm -hmm. peer pressure and alcohol motherfuckers collectively in culture ever it's like can i get you a drink can i get you a shot you know it's been wow, a long yeah. time since i've seen you let me get you a shot and like no like i don't i don't want more alcohol now yeah. i appreciate the gesture when you're young you might be like oh free shot sweet you know <laughs> saved me six dollars or whatever the fuck but like ultimately you have to be really mindful of those social influences and have a very strong like perspective on what yeah. are you trying to get out of this situation? How is this going to enhance it? And then what are the potential dangers that you have to look out ahead in advance and figure out? And then that opens you up into the freedom to kind of get a little bit more loose with, uh, with, with what you're doing. And one of the things that I've learned being in this group that like really surprised me was like, when I f saw you guys party the first time, I won't get into the details, but like, I remember it very clearly. Like, I got terrified. Like, I had a panic response. And I actually, <laughs> but it was, it was because so I was projecting, <laughs> like, that I thought that I had to, like, take drugs and that I had to, like, do things I didn't want to do. And, like, um, Liv actually could, like, feel it. And she came up to me and she was like, you know, like, are you okay? And this is, like, when I first started at on it, and I was yeah. just a fucking guppy in every way. And one of the things that I've learned since then 
And I, cause I ran the experiment multiple times where like we get into that space and I don't do anything and no one has ever acted weird about it. No one has ever pressured me and I got to feel <laughs> safe. Caitlin's laughing because th there are times where she does pressure me, but it's great. <laughs> it's Come on, babe. <laughs> I'm just kidding. But like one of the things that I've learned, because when I was in like high school and college and I was in a party situation, I felt like I needed alcohol or something mm -hmm. to like have a good time. Because of the work that we've done with things like, like ecstatic dance, like the first ecstatic dance that I did that you led changed my life. In that, like, I got to feel what it felt like to fully express without the help of anything. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And now I can be in any situation and either take nothing or take a very small microdose of something like a boga. And I can just go for like six hours. Mm -hmm. And it's just like, it's the best. And no one's trying to make me do anything. And one of the things that I think is beautiful for people to learn to at least even experiment with is... Can you be in the places that you touch with medicine sober? Because like the thing that the medicine can do is it can unlock rooms in your psyche for the first time. But once it's unlocked, you can get back there if you want and just like train that muscle. And at the same time, everything's better with the right amount of mushrooms. Just, you, can, <laughs> you can put that in a fucking clip and give it to people. Uh, yeah. Write them out. Write them out. Being yes. the being yes. the key phrase in that. Uh, <clears throat> in that, yeah. How about how about for you, Kyle? Where did it start to transition from? You know, the tragic, which was really heavy and and deep for you, into into the post tragic, and where have you know on both sides of the journey, where has the the tragic stepped back up? You know, reared its ugly head, and and then you know. So tell us about your journey. Yeah, the the tragic. You know. But as I mentioned, Huiti introduced me to plant medicines. The first thing we did for two years was just the Anipi. We worked in the sweat lodges and it took me kind of pressuring him to work with La Medicina and he just burst out laughing. And, and uh, we started working with psilocybin and eventually ayahuasca. And the medicines themselves are so revealing, you know, but in the correct set and setting with the right guidance, the right container. And that allowed me to see for myself kind of the ways that I was and, and how I had treated myself and, and what, how polarized my fight career was. So I retired at 32 and I had only been really been working with the medicines for three or four years when that happened. And then now I had, I don't have a fight camp anymore. What does that look like? Uh, cool. I can do more medicine. I can figure out more. And then holy shit. Now there's a point of diminishing returns based on how often I go back to the wishing well and, and really figuring out what is appropriate really learning how to listen to my intuition like what am i guided to and and you know there is a point where you you go into the deep ceremony and you come out and for many of us we get into it and it's like we fall back into the the matrix and we're like well when's the next ceremony i got more questions and and when can i go have these answered and then at a certain point you have the ceremony and you come out and you're like life's the fucking ceremony this is all mm -hmm. god consciousness this is all the eternal game working itself out where why don't I take that respect and reverence to the game itself? Why don't I take mm -hmm. that to my daily? And fundamentally, that didn't shift for, I don't know, really until probably like 2018, 2019. So I'd moved here. We had been partying. We've been doing different things. And then it just kind of hit. Mm -hmm. And I don't know when it hit, but it just settled in my body. Um, and, and, even after that hit and I was taking care of myself and, and finding right relation with, with the different ways that I expressed the celebration or push the joy button, you know, like the bliss button. All right, we're going to do the bliss button tonight. Finding right relation with that meant I didn't hurt the next day. I could still parent. I wasn't going to be a douche. You know, I wasn't going to be a shitty dad. That's important. And, and it has been a guiding light for me because it's different when you got to wake up the next day and be a dad. It's completely different. Um, and at the same time, the tragic has slipped back in plant medicines and you guys are all well aware of it, but um, having some of the deeper dives with medicine, you know, through guys like Kalindi I and 30 grams of psilocybin to, you know, doing combo before an initiatory dose with 5-MeO where I was completely cleaned out and having to go to night school where for 17 days straight, I was on medicine. I hadn't taken any more medicine, but every night I went to bed, it would fucking, if I actually slept, I would go back in full on into a journey for six hours and all dark, all unconscious. 
and no real guidance there. You know, it took Paul Check doing a closing ceremony with me over the phone on Christmas Eve. I snapped out of it and actually got my life back. And there's been a lot of alchemy from that. Like you said, two years, like it's a fucking process. And we've met, di met different helpers along the way, introduced, finally got to meet Hamilton Souther last year. And there was extreme alchemy with getting to sit with him. Um, you know, Gaffney and Churchill and these different people that are breaking down first principles and my understanding of consciousness, they're giving me a framework to sit with mm -hmm. has been really beneficial as well. Because, you know, the point on plant medicines is that you can have posit really positive experiences and, and, and you can revisit some of the dark, hard parts that you might avoid as a rookie, but later you realize this is actually beneficial. And you go through those and you're like, wow, I've worked through the dark shit. I've healed, I've done all the things. And then it's like, and you can still go way the fuck out beyond one's own capability. Hell is processing. always available. Yeah. Yep. And, um, and, you know, hitting those spots, especially having responsibilities like being a dad and a husband and things like that are the, the scariest fucking thing I've ever done in my entire life. You know, like there's nothing when you blur the lines of reality to the point where you question everything, it's a hard road back from that. And, you know, as Paul mentioned, he's like, you're probably, my guess is you're going to have a lot of people that go through this that you know, and you're going to, it's going to be up to you to help them out. And this is a great point. It's been the case for me. It's a hard fucking pill to swallow initially, but that has been the case for me. And it has been positive to have gone through that experience and to be able to allow people to track back. Yeah. Um, but that is, you know, without the intention of fast track into self mastery, a fast track into really deep diving uh, the principles of consciousness and how we work with that. And uh, I don't recommend that for anyone. You know, I, I said, I remember coming out of that, I was like, I wouldn't wish that on Bill Gates. I would wish that on no person, whatever enemy, non enemy, Klaus Schwab, like mm. I would wish that on no one to have that experience ever. Um, in many ways, it, it felt like pure torture. And from that, there's been a lot of alchemy. You know, I felt with Hamilton that ayahuasca would help finish the job. And not that it's finished, but um, when we went out to Sultara in April, like there was a lot of alchemy there physically too. You know, I had uh -huh. PTSD basically in my body where mm. if I had a memory of that experience, I would feel a cortisol dump, an adrenaline dump in my body, like, oh, fuck. And I was able to help me work through that through breathing and just feeling that shudder, you know, the tremor in my body. I had to release uh -huh. that. That was from medicine journeys that wasn't yeah. from like like i don't have ptsd from war that i'm working through that came from medicine journeys going the wrong way yeah. and then i had to track that back to heal from it and now i'm in a position where um i can work with the medicine when i feel called to it and it's it's less often than it was maybe quarterly maybe three times a year and that 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 changes and there's variety there but with that i have the ultimate respect and reverence for it mm -hmm. and with that as well i, I see the ceremony of life as, as it is, it is a ceremony. And with that, you know, you talked about the hummingbird medicine and, and the joy and drinking the nectar of the light from the flower. And like, that is equal to the importance was we weigh the darkness of empire with the, the challenge of, of returning to the kingdom. We have to experience that, you know, how do I push the celebration button that, that is going to leave me more whole than when I started, that, that isn't paid for on credit where I have three days of fucking beating myself up for what I did that night, right. but I actually come out of it better, you know? And that's been a really cool trajectory to have where I can now know, like, this is how I can party. This is how I can get down. And, and you know, I might need to sleep for 10 hours or take a nap the next day, but I'm gonna feel fucking good. Mm -hmm. And I'm not gonna be sad. And I'm not gonna be short tempered with my kids or anything mm -hmm. like that. I'm gonna be me the next day, mm -hmm. but I can still fucking say yes to joy and bliss and celebration like that. I think we're all looking for that because we want, we want to get out of our heads to break the habit of being ourselves. We want to get out of our heads to change and, and have an altered state. And that doesn't always mean going to see God on 5-MEO. It might just mean I want to fucking let loose, yeah. mm -hmm. you know, I want to dance away the fucking struggle and, and having ways in which we can do that has been paramount to balancing the tipping point of empire and, and seeing all the shit that I've seen. I think a really important context for people listening is that like, as above, so below our consciousness is mediated because we have two hemispheres. One hemisphere focuses on the particular. It's the thing that cuts up reality so we can look at one thing. And that's the left hemisphere for most people. And the right hemisphere sees the gestalt. Like it's able to see the forest and it zooms out. 
And culture is like that too. And Nietzsche had a really great essay where he talked about that we get this from the Greek culture, but that it was ruled by two gods, Apollo and Dionysus. And Apollo is the god of the left hemisphere. It's the god of the particular. It's the god of the daylight. It's the god of order and government and all that shit. But that what the Greeks figured out was that that has to be balanced by the god of Dionysus. And that's the god of the right hemisphere. That's the god of getting out of the pattern of who you think you are. And culture seems to require that. And individuals seem to require that. And there's actually evolutionary biology research that all, and Arby talked about this at the beginning, but the higher the intelligence of the mammal, the higher the drive to change its consciousness with drugs. So like the dolphins and the jaguars and all that stuff. And like, we have the burden of this incredible intelligence and we have a biological drive to like flip back into the other hemisphere because it's how we actually learn new things. It's how we have insights. It's how we have epiphanies and we have this drive. And so talking about the tools that allows us to mediate this drive and not destroy our lives is, you know, really important and dare didn't do it. Yeah. And, and I, I think what we're talking about here is in this Dionysian urge is the desire to break out of the patterns exactly. because we're, we're such yes. creatures of habit and pattern. Like once a pattern is established or a bias is a bias is made, like I decided that I didn't like opera or ballet at a certain point along my path. It was like, I don't like these things. And then through my medicine, through my medicine journeys and opening and unlocking, I was able to actually, and now I'm able to actually see a deeper layer in there where I'm like, whoa, like yeah. I can get into this. I can actually slip into this consciousness and really appreciate what's going on here. So it opens up the world to possibilities that are beyond what I ever thought possible. I really, really started to get that is at this last burning man that I went to. And because I started to be able to understand which medicines I could do, how I could do them. I had a kind of pattern for the day. I would have, you know, one meal, which was like breakfast kind of early. And then I would, which would be, you know, I don't know, two, three o'clock, something like that. And then the heat of the day, I would go into my own, you know, my own journey with my headphones alone in the bed, my own energy. And then I would pop out of that, you know, after people were finished with dinner, somewhere around like seven or eight before dusk. And I was just energized, charged up on fire. And then I would just kind of mediate that consciousness for as long as the night was going with a variety of different tools in my medicine bag. And I was able to unlock a joy at Burning Man that even for the previous three years, which was wild and expansive, I was still hadn't unlocked the secret joy of every little art installation and how you could unlock each different puzzle and each different piece. And, yeah. and, uh, and so it was like seven days of, of basically perpetual ecstasis. Mm -hmm. And it was like, it was really incredible. And, and so, you know, this year I'm not going to Burning Man, which was, and I've already paid for, you know, like 70% <laughs> of it, which is hella annoying is, uh, but, um, Ultimately, you know, there may be some people who can take our spot or whatever, but the decision was ultimately made that even though this is the funnest time I've ever had in my life, I met my wife, Ilana there, and we had an amazing time. The world's actually calling me to something different. And I think also one of the, one of the reasons that that decision has been easier is that, you know, there was many things about Burning Man that I loved and some things that I thought like this could be better. And I think starting to feel that was one of the impetus impetuses for us to create Arcadia, like create our own festival, mm -hmm. very different than Burning Man. Nothing is going to be like Burning Man, but like, what are the best ways to bring the post tragic consciousness of a celebration of life? That's not substance dependent right. in any direction, but can snap you into that state of awe and wonder and consciousness and focus and purpose. And that the aftertaste, you know, what Gaffney talks about all the time is like, what is the aftertaste? Like usually the aftertaste of masturbating to porn is like, man, it's not a good aftertaste, <laughs> yeah. right? Like the aftertaste is not good. The Damn experience, it, not might, again. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know, the aftertaste is not good. Certain other sexual encounters is not good. Other medicine experiences or drinking experiences, like the aftertaste is not good. But when you're doing it right, the aftertaste is fucking sweet, you know, yeah. and you're laughing and you're telling stories and you can't wait 
to get together with everybody to talk about what happened. And you still tell stories. It brings a smile to your face, you know, to the same day when you get to tell it. Because mm-hmm. that's because the aftertaste is really sweet. And I think that's the idea for Arcadia is just to create this ecstatic experience, bringing in both Apollo and Dionysus, right. allowing them to merge, you know, allowing the masculine and feminine principles to merge, allowing awe and wonder to be available, which is something that Meow Wolf, which is part of our experience, does an amazing job putting you into an altered state of consciousness by the environment yeah. that you're in. It's like going through an augmented reality, but actually in the physical 3D, it's, it's wild. And, uh, and that's really kind of what I see is as this kind of future, you know, kind of post-tragic scenario where we're creating like the best music, the best speakers, the best, you know, sense of communitas and, and freedom, but still with, you know, all of the awareness of the tragic and a kind of mature approach to, all right, like, and having, you know, having proper support staff, like they do at the Zendo project for Burning Man and make sure that we have a full awareness of the full landscape of this. And, uh, and that we could really guide like an ecstatic experience, which then anchors in that passion and drive and joy for and zest for life in a world that you want to protect. Because Mm -hmm. unless you experience world is like, the more, the more that you experience world is heaven, the more you want to fight to save it. Of course. For sure. Like the more you love something, the more fiercely you're going to protect it. And then the more you love life, the more you want to build a beautiful life and also share because your cup is full and abundant. You want to share that beautiful life with everybody else. So I think that's a, it's, you know, it's kind of cool that we're now in this position of initially just experience these things as passengers and now stepping into like, all right, now let's create this. And same thing with, you know, medicine experiences. I haven't, I'm not there yet, but there'll be a time where I have a, you know, or we have a medicine facility somewhere where we're cultivating and we're already doing this in our own private ways, but cultivating like renting out Soltara, et cetera, but like really cultivating every aspect of, of the experience based upon our, you know, decades of experience with the medicines. Because like one of the tragedies of our time is that the vast majority of people, so there's like, if you imagine like a pie chart, probably at least half of people are so stressed that they don't think about a future at all. And then the majority of the remaining pie are people who have absolutely no belief that there is a possible future that's beautiful, that's worth fighting for or trying for or doing anything to help create And so there's not a lot of like hope or passion for a potential future. And that just like you said, the more that you can have experiences that can help you imagine that there is a future worth fighting for because the present is so fucking beautiful, people will actually start to make these micro changes in the ceremony of life that can start to like change the momentum of the apathy of our culture. And the thing that I really appreciate about Arcadia that I haven't seen at any of the festivals that I've gone to is the speakers have a type of like mythopoetic intention that then, and like, that's the Apollo. And then there's the music and the festival part where you get to like break yourself out of the disbelief that the future that they're painting is possible. And then you just like stumble into the fact that you believe it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then once you believe it, you actually become an agent in the world after the festival that can start to change things. Yeah, it's um, when I, I think my first shift towards the post-tragic, I was actually living in Las Vegas, which is where I went after we separated. And I lived there for four years. And for somebody who derived most of her um, sense of self-worth and self-love, from external validation combined with having very low impulse control. To live in that city um, was the perfect setting in the place that I was at at that time to um, to go even deeper into the tragic. And it was the ultimate period of tragedy of my life. And um, I ended up hitting such a point of... You know, it felt like the vampire archetype that we talk about recently, which is kind of one of these uh, mythic, symbolic 
concepts I've been exploring of the vampire slayer as truth and aliveness. But the hunger of that that impulse to derive a sense of aliveness from outside of yourself took me to a very, I was, I felt like I was starving spiritually. And so I went down to meet with Don Howard and drink ayahuasca in 2014. And I remember sitting on that boat in the middle of the night, it was super dark. And I, I'd never traveled anywhere like that by myself. Um, I didn't really, I couldn't speak the language. I was all alone. And I remember thinking, I don't actually know if I know where I'm going, but I, if I die here, it will be better than me dying in Las Vegas. And um, because I'm seeking to help myself. And basically it was the pattern, it was breaking the pattern of self-destruction for that easy, like pseudo Mm -hmm. um, aliveness that I felt in the party environment to actually be brave enough to take a risk, be terrified, be uncomfortable in the pursuit of healing. And so Mm -hmm. I went through many years of pursuing that healing, but there was a fracturing between where I still had Dionysus, but she wasn't allowed in the room of my healing, Apollo. And so the bridge really into the post-tragic came with me Mm. unifying myself without the shame of keeping her in a cage where she got to go crazy every now and then. Mm -hmm. But then I was just expressing in this new enlightened way. And that's a trap I think we fall into when we start, many of us, and I I definitely did, where we start to exile the part of the self that loves the Dionysian, yep. um, you know, experiences. And we we go into our spirituality so seriously. And it's like, I got to do the work and I've got to heal. And we end up doing this for years where we're just like rehashing trauma and um, taking ourselves incredibly seriously. No humor. Yeah. No and, and then we're missing the piece, which is um, to have the the fervor and the passion to be here and to do the work that we're meant to do. We have to enjoy it, yeah. you know? And I had a very profound, beautiful experience on the plane descending into Las Vegas last year where I recognized that for one, Setting is everything. And that's something that ceremony taught me, which is you can create a, an intentional space that, that yields beautiful benefits if you set the intention and you choose the environment that you're partying in. So it's not just a matter of like, I'm going to go drink now. It's like, well, where do I want to go? I'm actually making choices about what I would enjoy and really feeling into that before I choose yes or no, do I want to do this? And then with every opportunity to have another margarita or to, you know, partake in some kind of substance, it's really feeling into, you know, breaking that pattern of autopilot, which for me was the hunger to just fill this empty void and starting to break that pattern in a way of just making intentional choices. And I remember specifically at your birthday party in um, 2022, I had been on about five months of absolutely no intoxicants because I was going through a deep process, which is a very long story, but a deep process of reckoning with all of the grief that I had for the times that I lost consciousness and harmed myself and harmed my relationships. And um, But I chose, I was like, this is a party I want to be at. This mm-hmm. is an environment that I want to say yes to. And it's, um, I want to trust myself. Like renunciation doesn't, absolute indefinite renunciation doesn't feel like it's going to marry within me to give me the sacred marriage within myself that allows all of me to live this life. And I need both. And so I intentionally took my first drink for five months down to the water and I said a prayer and I asked the margarita to help me with the things that I was seeking out of the experience. And so going back to Las Vegas last year felt like just bringing in this quality of intention and love back to this place that I perceived as so dark because that we've exiled. I was in, I was in darkness. And so I was meeting all of the darkness there. And I had this, this beautiful full circle moment of, of bringing my unconditional love and my passion for what Vegas does offer, which is this playground of enjoyment for humanity to come have a taste of the Dionysian aspect of self. Um, but but put, using that intention that I brought to that first margarita with all of you to create a space where um, 
you know, playing as medicine. And that's one thing we saw definitely with Las Vegas is most people are stuck in the tragic of Las Vegas, which yeah. is very clear. There's the pre-tragic of Las Vegas, which is yarders and which is a, which is a yard long drink or a fucking football of some shitty fucking corn syrup and grain alcohol or whatever the fuck is in those things. And just, you know, fucking Hawaiian shirts and sunburned faces and fucking it's and then like zombies walking through the casino with their shoes in their hand and fucking like you screaming. yeah like the whole the whole thing and then also the people yep. just losing a bunch of money and still gambling more mm -hmm. and not able to it allows you know but so we you get stuck in the tragic but there's also a pre-tragic urge to it what happens in vegas stays in vegas you're free your record's clean you know you get mm -hmm. to actually break out of the bounds and it gives you permission to do that so there's that kind of pre-tragic then there's the tragic and then there's the post-tragic Vegas, which having, we didn't want Arcadia originally to be there, but through a series of circumstances completely out of our control last year, it guided us directly to Area 15, where that yeah. was the only place where we could make it happen or cancel it entirely. We went for it, even though it wasn't our first choice. And then we got to actually claim the post-tragic of Las Vegas yes. with what we did, creating a bubble inside not only the Area 15 complex, but also you know, re-understanding and reimagining Las Vegas in its entirety. And Matias, who hates Las Vegas, Matias Stefano, <laughs> uh, because he'd experienced the tragic and been swarmed by a bunch of demons when he, when he went there, he was like, fuck Vegas. And then he immediately goes out to the mountains and connects with the spirits of the land. And then, you know, believe this or not, you know, whether depending on your belief field, but I know it to be reality because we saw it happen recently in fucking Greece. He conjured a storm in Las Vegas and it just dumped rain. And for and him, rainbows and rain and rainbows, like bringing what he calls the new information and connecting, connecting the spirit with the spirits of the land and then the spirits mm -hmm. of the sky and like really creating this novel environment of a post-tragic Las Vegas. So. And the record will show that after we left, many casinos got flooded from the amount of weird rain that they got so <laughs> right. you guys can take yeah, that take that take that for what it will but if once you've seen it with your own eyes a couple times you start to lose the the materialist reductionist skepticism and understand that you know there's things that are going on beyond our imagination that are happening so um when it came time to do decide what we were going to do with arcadia because we could have done it anywhere we we're like no that was special yeah like what we were doing was reclaiming a sacred spark in a place where most most people think there's only desolation. And I've seen that in many different environments, not just Las Vegas. I remember one particular, I've told this story before, one particularly strong, you know, kind of recognition of this was when we were in Miami and you invited me down to this kind of like spiritual circle. And all I saw was people like flaunting this kind of superficial spirituality and talking about how many ceremonies they'd done and how mm -hmm. evolved they were and it was just like uh like yeah. let me vomit on myself <laughs> and get out of here as <laughs> soon as possible and then we did a little bit of this is during the kind of even florida had these quasi curfew lockdowns even in the thick of it so 11 which is this famous strip club nightclub was only open till like midnight which is crazy for 11 because nobody goes to 11 till like two in the morning, right? <laughs> like that's the nature of the club. But so we, we took a little medicine early on in the day in like probably like 7 PM and got there by like 8 PM. And as soon as I got there, you know, the, the people there, just like at Burning Man, but with radical authenticity, because they didn't, they weren't rushed. They weren't stressed. They just looked me in the eye, looked us in the eye. And they're like, welcome home. I was like, what? <laughs> not only what they said, but like right. what they expressed and every single person in there, you know, free of, and I've been back to 11 in the busy times. And it was like, what happened to this Haven? But I went there and it was like, there was the divine living inside that place, which is only known for debauchery. And it was this really like post tragic experience with everybody from the dancers to the, you know, people who are sweeping up the money and sweeping up the floor <laughs> and to the other people that we met there and to the, staff and the whole situation was like reclaimed in a new way it's like what paul selig says it's like another octave it's yep. like you can find you it at another octave you can't underestimate for anybody out there who's wanting to just subtly but profoundly shift your relationship to you know um whatever you know for example i want to say the phrase pick your poison what 
what, how would it feel to say something like mind your medicine or mediate your medicine? And the way you just said before we went to 11, we took a little medicine. It's just a little language change, but the whole, our perception was shifted right. because of that, the, the relationship that we had to what we were taking. It was like, we're taking some medicine we're taking to go it, we're have taking a it good yeah, exactly. time, a good so time. So our intention was aligned <laughs> with actually the, the experience that we had. And so the aftertaste the whole right. thing was sweet. It was it sweet the whole shameful, way through. Like, it was sweet the whole way through and sweet the whole way after. You know, it's mm -hmm. like still thinking of those times. It was like, oh yeah, that was a good yeah. fucking choice. Yeah, a couple of things. Um, Kyle and I talk about this all the time, but like our, like how we bifurcate between when is it medicine and when is it a drug is, does it, do I wake up the following day with more in me? Like, right. and there's also this essence and it can apply to any chemical is, am I taking it to get deeper into the now? Or am I taking it to avoid more of the now? Yep. And if you take it to go deeper into the now, I mean, I think it makes sense to use something like the word medicine as opposed to drug. And like the thing that was coming up as you two shared is again, this as above, so below thing. So from a Jungian slash internal family systems standpoint, whatever part of your experience of life, you exile. It becomes a stranger at the window trying to break in. But all of the parts are parts of you. And you have the capacity as the king or the queen of your psyche to invite them in, like Rumi says, and like have tea with them. And what people miss is that whatever your conception is of Las Vegas or drugs, it's it's a part in your psyche, like as above, so below that you're exiling. And those parts, they all want to come in. They all want to be held. They all want to be seen. They all want to have a chance to come through and like be on the throne and play in the game of life. And like the thing that comes to mind is the Rainmaker story, which I have told at ad nauseum. I won't tell it again, but that like the spiritual, I think, highest game is to go to the place where no one else goes and bring the rainmaker energy to it, yeah. bring the order, bring the love. And like the warrior aspect of the spiritual game is go where everyone else is afraid to go, you know? Yes. And like people are afraid to go to the symbolic Las Vegas, you know, that's like from the Lion King when Mufasa says, don't go where the sun doesn't shine. But what does the hero do? You know, he fucking went. What place mm. needs the light? Mm -hmm. Yeah, the light. The light is like uh, all of those places that are murky. They're actually, they're actually trying to draw in as much light as possible. And there's the kind of vampiric element of that, where there's a force that wants to suck the life force out of you and like create more deadness and numbness. And this is what the Kabbalists would call Sitra Akra, the upside down world, or the turning of the face from God. And there's forces that are pulling and 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 almost harvesting that energy from an egregore, from a, like a collective perspective. And there are, there are dark energies that feed off of that. And then there's also, you know, where do angels, where do angels want to be? Do they want to just hang out with each other in the country club of heaven? Or do they looking down at the places that need them the most and be like, no, I'm going there to angels that slum. Are badasses. Exactly. <laughs> They're like drawn Heroes. to it by, by, it, by its very nature, mm -hmm. you know, like drawn into the, drawn into the fray, drawn into the muck, drawn into, to show, you know, to bring God everywhere where God is not. And God is everywhere on that perspective. But you, what I'm God saying is, is the force, the, the face of God that I'm describing as life force itself, as mm. life, as that life energy itself, rather than the opposite force, which is the drawing into the deadness of the universe, which again, there's a conception of God, which includes both void vacuum and light. You know, I was, kind of pondering upon this recently, like nature abhors a vacuum. What does that mean? It means that in nature, there's hardly ever a vacuum. When there's a void, there wants to be molecules, which is represents life and eros, the attraction and allurement between even quantum particles, quarks and atoms and everything. It wants to draw that into the empty space because that's where eros is, which is yeah. another face of and way to understand God is allurement and attraction and, and aliveness always wants to draw it into that moment. So 
all of this dark energy, you can start to see from the highest, highest perspective is just like, oh, it's just trying to get a little taste of God, even the pseudo eros is like you talked about. And what Gabor Mate would talk about, like this attempt, you know, the addict is trying to solve a problem, it's trying yeah. to bring God yeah. into a place where there's deadness, in the vacuum, it's trying to draw it in. But if it's drawing in the false God, what like the Rosicrucians would call like that Luciferian energy that the false light, which is never satiating and satisfying, but it masquerades as light, but it's not really the light. You know, it's just the false light. It's like the saccharin or, you know, Nutrisweet version of the sugar. <laughs> that, the, aspartame. that aspartame, the aspartame that the hummingbird is, you know, might find is sweet, but it would die. You know, if, if, great metaphor, if the hummingbird yeah. had aspartame flowers, it'd be fucking dead hummingbirds everywhere. Like it needs like the real nectar, <laughs> the real honey. And then yeah. its little fucking wings can flap and it can have little hummingbird wars with its, with its friends and fucking shine its beautiful iridescent feathers all over the place. And, and so, you know, it's really learning how to distinguish between the light, the real light, and then the false light and where that lives within you and make peace with all of these forces that are inside but this is this is a there's just levels on levels on levels of mastery of how you actually navigate this in a way where you're really seeing things clearly you're balanced you're aware of the traps and pitfalls of inflation that can come where you start to think that you're somehow the only one or the special one it's like Red flag, yeah, red flag. Exactly. It's like, I, I mean, whenever we get it surprisingly, you know, too much where someone will claim to be both either Jesus or Lucifer himself, you know, or like one of these the massive, only. the one and only. And you're like, no, no, really? like you could be tapping into Christic energy for sure. All of us. That's the whole point, as he was talking about tapping It's like into if the you Christic get wet energy. and you're like, I am the ocean. Exactly. No, or I, I, am, I, am the amb- <laughs> yeah, I am the ambassador of water. I've had that conversation where someone's i you're the ambassador like the only one <laughs> wow all right well see you later <laughs> highlander <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> like see you later um but yeah it's like it's it's really trying to understand this whole field and if people don't have conversations like we have and also guide experiences with this knowledge and and actually understanding the whole field then we're not going to be able to enter that kind of post-tragic ability to bring the beauty of the pre-tragic, the awareness of the tragic into a post-tragic environment, which is part of the more beautiful world our hearts know is possible, which is the synchronicity machine that a festival can create right. where you meet people you never would have met. Like, again, I met my wife, Vailana, at Burning Man. Wouldn't have happened if it wasn't for Burning Man. I mean, I don't know how else it would have happened, but you know, the forces that were working found a way through you know, synchronicity after synchronicity to bring us together. So we came into contact and then that unfolded, you know, in the sequence of four years, which included a lot of tragedy, but eventually brought us together into that. And that's the beauty of what these festivals or experiences can have both personally and and collectively. And the thing that comes to mind that like just popped up is it's like the post-tragic requires community in the sense, and there's a couple of aspects to this. One, like, conduct yourself with your friends in a way where your friends feel safe to call you out when you've tripped. Like if you get too inflated or too depressed, having friendships to like outsource your sanity to is like a requirement. And also you just brought it up, but like festivals allow for synchronicities to emerge where like the metaphor that comes to me is it feels like we're all born oriented towards a different type of constellation. And that's the type of horizon that our soul wants to look at. A part of the game of life is finding the other people who are drawn to that same horizon. And there's something about a festival that confesses something about reality that we don't understand, where there's something inside of us that can be in a crowd of, you know, 80,000 people at Burning Man. And if you feel the intention of wanting to meet X person, You just stumble onto them and you have the opportunity to create a connection with someone who's going to be like a brother or a sister that could go on your bead necklace for the rest of your life. And this is one of the things that it's hard to explain about like fit for service, like the most important, like the thing that makes it medicine is not the talks we give or the initiatory experiences we give, even though all that's dope. 
but you have almost a 100% chance to meet someone that will know you when you die. And it's like, there's something about the festival that allows for that to emerge and that the post-tragic, you know, is a community. It's not an individual. Uh I feel like, um, I feel like it's really important to just hone in on what I see there is that what happens when you go to a festival is similar to what happens when you go to a well-curated medicine space. Like if you take ayahuasca in your living room by yourself, I don't believe you will have the same experience. The medicine won't be the same. Mm. And when you go to a festival, you are in this unspoken agreement with everybody who's there to fully express yourself, to expect magic, to expect wonder, to expect beauty. You're looking for it. Everyone's looking for it. When when everybody comes to fit for service, there's a shared Im- implicit understanding that you're safe to be who you are. You're safe to open up. And that's what happens at Burning Man too, is there's a guiding principle that allows freedom that actually changes reality. So if we go to Las Vegas Strip, for example, and we have this preconceived notion that there's all all of this darkness there and we feel shame in our bodies for being there, well, shame and darkness is what you're going to experience. But if you go there, you know, to look at all of the creativity, the one that mind boggling wonders that are everywhere, the beautiful sunsets, the red rock horizon, that's what you'll see and that's what you'll get. It's important. It really changes everything. We can bring that little bit of, it's, it's choosing our reality mm. and every chosen reality that each person will initiate unlocks the medicine that we all get to share and actually changes the world. Yeah. Well, this is a, this is also an invitation. Like if you want to be on this journey with us and see what we're trying to build here, and uh i think we did a hell of a job last year and we created an unbelievable experience it's like highlight of the year for so many of the people who attended and and us like being there both facilitating and attending and this year we're just going to blow that out of the fucking water yeah <laughs> it's going to be yeah. it's going to be next level and who knows what this becomes you know but uh but really you know, we, we believe in it and that's why we're doing it. You know, the, the financial models of it are all fucking backwards. It's a huge losing proposition at this point. So, but ultimately there's something about it that we believe in and Mm. we believed in it passionately enough to like ante up and say like, no, we're going to run this back because there was something special that was created. I remember I gave my closing talk and there was without any prompting, I go off stage, all everybody in the room comes and huddles in this giant spiraling circle of 500 people and just starts like holding each other's shoulders and like erupting in a in a raucous cheer and roar you know that just happened because of the that shared space that was created so when i saw that i was like all right we're on to something here and uh and we're gonna fucking keep it going yeah we are (laughs) it's a fucking honor yeah it's an honor and Indeed. it's the it's the ultimate alchemy of everything that I used to enjoy in the pre-tragic world that I now get to enjoy in full aliveness. Mm-hmm. So oh, I'm amen. so excited for it. All the things. <laughs> uh, if you're interested, fitforservice.com slash Arcadia with a K. And uh, yeah, let's we'll fucking see you there. We'll see you there. Let's, let's go. go. <laughs> Kyle, Eric, Caitlin, <laughs> you're all on my necklace. I love you forever forever and ever to the end all the way all love the you way. Too, yeah love you guys love we'll you see guys. Next week. <laughs> thanks for tuning into this video make sure you hit subscribe follow me at aubrey marcus check out the aubrey marcus podcast available everywhere and leave a comment let me know if this video resonated or what else you would like to hear from me in the future thank you so much